Welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us tonight for a talk on critical incident stress management. Um, a very important talk, uh, in my opinion. So I'm happy to see so many of you joining into this session. Tonight we have the pleasure of having two different people uh, presenting. And with that, I'll pass it over to Ria, who I believe is starting first. All right, thank you very much, Anna. Hi, everyone, my name's Ria. I'm, um, some of you may know me, lots of you may not, um, and I'm the lead for the Critical Instrument Stress Management team that we have in St. John Ambulance here in BC. Um, and I just have a short little PowerPoint I wanted to go through with you guys, just a little bit of information about CISM and our team in case you ever need to contact us for anything. Uh, I won't take too long, I don't wanna to take too much time from Marsha. Um, I've got a few slides here that I'll go through. It's my first time using the online Zoom to present, so bear with me. Okay, all right. So uh, just to go through the mission of our team is our team is meant to help support the psychological and emotional health of all our St. John Edmonds Brigade members by providing individual and group diffuses and also through education. Um, about how to identify and manage critical incident stress. So we do that through preparation, education, intervention. So um, we help, we uh, try to get out to as many divisions as we can, a little more difficult now, of course, um, and do orientations about CSM so that everyone's aware of what to watch out for. Um, and then we also do diffuses and debriefs, uh, usually over the phone, uh, whenever a critical incident uh, has happened. And uh, we have seven division or uh, seven team members as of right now. We have one in Prince George. Uh, we have a couple in Nanaimo as well, and then uh, in Vancouver and Richmond, and uh, a couple of us in Abbotsford as well. So that way we can cover a fairly large area to help out as many people as possible. And of course, we're always available on the phone, but sometimes we do try to go out as well for if there's a larger incident. And so just to get into the importance of uh, CSM, there's a, we're finding that there's a growing need for it amongst first responders. And also that includes um, those as our uh, uh, St. John Edmonds members that are just doing first aid rather than working with uh, companies such as BC Ambulance and uh, as in the hospital. Um, and just as a large grouping, we're finding that uh, some of the statistics are that one in five first responders will develop post-traumatic stress disorder during the course of their career. So it's a big thing and it can really sneak up on people. Uh, and there's still a stigma associated with talking about it. I think it's gotten a lot better than it, it was in the past, but there's still that stigma where, you know, you feel like, you know, maybe this is no big deal. Why is this bothering me? Um, but it's so important to recognize when you're starting to really struggle with those things and be able to recognize that you might need to go talk to someone and um, get some help to sort through it. Through it. Um, some more to statistics here is uh, different percentages of PTSD prevalence in, uh, in Canada. So you can see that um, paramedics, there's quite a high incidence at 26% of uh, lifetime prevalence. But then if you look at the very bottom with volunteer first responders, there's actually quite a high prevalence as well, 12 to 23%. And um, I sometimes wonder how much of that could be, um, of course, you know, it, it depends where and exactly how much um, incidents happen, but uh, a lot of our organizations, such as paramedics like BC Ambulance, I know in uh, BC has their, their SASM program, of course, and a lot of um, nurses, doctors in hospitals, that have, they have their own organizational CSM team as well that they can access. But for those first responders who don't have any uh, perhaps don't have any first aid background. Uh, they're teachers, you know, we, we, all, we all come from a lot of different walks of life and we don't have that team to connect with if something has happened. So that's where our team comes in to be able to provide that support when um, someone needs it, especially if they don't have anything else they can reach out to. And even if, it, and it doesn't necessarily, one thing that came up once is, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that happened at work or sorry, uh, while at an event, you know, if something happens, uh, like something big happens, anything um, at home or just when you're driving home, you know, from uh, work or anything, um, we're 100% there for those types of situations as well. It doesn't have to be at a St. John Ambulance event. 
Um, so when it comes to defining critical incident stress itself and what it actually means, it's uh, an unusually challenging event that is able to create significant human distress and can overwhelm coping abilities. That's one of the key things. You're no longer able to cope through what's, uh, what's going on. It's a state of heightened cognitive, physical, emotional, and behavioral arousal that accompanies the crisis. And a psychological crisis uh, is when it's developed for this acute response to a critical incident. So that's when it's completely um, unbalanced, your homeostasis, where you're not able to cope um, and you have evidence of significant distress and impairment and dysfunction. And we'll talk a little bit about the symptoms. Cumulative stress is another thing that uh, can, where it can kind of sneak up on you over time. It slowly builds up. Um, you have a lot of different um, symptoms that it can slowly build up on you over time, but they kind of sneak up on you. They're not necessarily too obvious, and it eventually over time can erode those coping me mechanisms that you have. There's three different phases. There's um, the first phase where it starts to build up. You can have anxiety or panic, difficulty concentrating. I know for myself, a lot of times when you do have a, a difficult situation at work or anything, you can have a little bit of difficulty concentrating in the moment, um, feeling a bit of out, out of control, and you start to have a bit of that, you know, your heart rate's going faster and things like that. But then over time, once, you know, the situation's uh, finished, then it does go back to um, your normal um, the second phase is the energy conservation phase. That's where things are starting to get a little bit worse. You're starting to struggle and you might start seeing in yourself or of course in others, it's very important to be there for, you know, to keep an eye on each other as well, but you might start seeing procrastination happening, lateness, um, skipping work shifts, volunteering when that's not normally something you would do, uh, withdrawal and avoidance and increased consumption of, of things like tobacco, coffee, things that you don't necessarily always drink that much, but just increased consumption to help you manage. The, and then the, there's the exhaustion phase. That's where things have gotten just way too far for how, for what that person can handle. You're feeling hopeless, um, might have developed uh, full depression um, and con serious consideration of actually changing your job or where you live or just completely changing your living situation because you can't cope with where you're at. And part of what uh, de defines critical incident stress is the stress itself. So it's a critical incident that invokes those uh, different symptoms. And the severity and duration can vary a lot between people based on your experience. So I know a lot of members, especially from the Victoria Division, a lot of you are paramedics. And we, I know we have plenty of nurses and doctors in the group as well. And for those of us volunteers who don't have a first aid background, if we deal with a cardiac arrest, that's a huge deal, of course. But for others of us who have dealt with many of them, that's not as big of a deal and might not be something that for them would trigger uh, a CISM call. Um, so experience can have a big factor in how you respond to a situation, to a uh, potentially critical incident. Your role in the incident can also uh, change how you react if you were the primary responder or maybe you just came in to help that can really affect uh, your response as well. And then also the composition of the group. If you know everyone you were working with, uh, we were all maybe, you know, St. James volunteers, then it helps because we're more, we can expect a little bit more of what, how it's all gonna work. Whereas if, um, say there's a bystander that happened to see what was happening, or, you know, um, one of us didn't have much experience and isn't really familiar with the group yet, that can change um, your reaction as well. And then it is also always important to keep in mind that any any time anything happens that brings up any sort of symptoms that you're noticing in yourself, that's completely normal. It's a completely normal response to have that, to an, something unusual that you haven't seen before. So this is just a breakdown of the different signs and symptoms. There's cognitive ones, and distress is just like a starting point, and dysfunction is where it's becoming severe, and um, it's just gotten. Um, quite far and you're really needing a lot of help at that point. So with distress, you might see things like difficulty making decisions, a lot of guilt. That's, a, I would say, a pretty common one, you know, worrying that maybe you miss something. Uh, preoccupation, just thinking about it all the time, um, maybe some confusion. And um, those are all very normal things to have. And typically you'll see that for a few days and then they start to get better. That's typically what you would expect to see. And dysfunction is when it just does not get any better. It's persistent. Um, 
constantly thinking about it, say, disabling guilt uh, and things like that. And then under emotional, you can see uh, things such as anxiety, irritability, mood swings. Um, you're just finding that you're constantly overwhelmed. You can't really just have, really having trouble managing your moods more, more so than is what, what, whatever your normal is. And, um, and then dysfunction is for when the symptoms have lasted for more than 30 days. So they're just persistent. It's not getting any better. And they can have panic attacks, um, that severe, severe depression and, um, physical is again you know you can feel that tachycardia headaches uh, hyperventilation muscle spasms especially in the moment uh, you can get quite um, tense of course psychogenic sweating um, and just a lot of fatigue and, and exhaustion just you know through the fatigue no matter how much you sleep I find you sleeping a lot if you're not sleeping or if you're sleeping less you have insomnia as well and um, this can be benefits to very severe you can have just pain, uh, recurrent dizziness and seizures. It's amazing um, how even though there's no physical actual injury, it's, a, it's an injury to your brain. It can cause such severe symptoms if it's not um, dealt with. And then, so this is the goals of our CISM team. So what we want to be able to do for all our volunteers um, is to help them recognize any symptoms that they might be having and that, and of course, recognize again, again, that it's completely normal, um, recognizing what they might look like, what they, what symptoms they might have, uh, and then helping them to work through them, find some coping mechanisms to, um, get through the symptoms and and to be able to and help them restore to independent function so if they're finding that they're having troubles um just doing their normal day-to-day -day lives that helping them find ways to cope and get back to being able to do what they need to do and then if uh, there's ever someone that is struggling a lot and needs some extra help then we will also facilitate access to like a counselor or whatever it is that they might need These are uh, some different ways of self-care, different coping mechanisms you can use. So it's always very important within those first couple of days after a critical incident to make sure you're getting enough sleep, give your brain what it needs to, uh, to think through and, and um, process what happened. Avoid drugs and excessive alcohol use. They've actually found that alcohol use can, uh, I forget the exact, exact stats, but definitely like double how long it can take you to recover from a critical incident. Um, get some physical exercise, whatever it is you enjoy, some time outside, you know, jump on the treadmill, get some healthy meals, um, make sure you're getting what you need. Because your brain can be like in just constant processing mode and it needs what it, you need to make sure you get plenty of good meals in there to support all that. And uh, structure your time, make sure you, um, different people have different ways of coping as well. Some people, you know, don't want to talk to too many people about it, whereas others want to just have lots of people to talk to about it. and you know, whatever you need, make sure you just have someone you can talk to when you need it. And be willing to express your feelings as well. Don't feel like you need to, you know, that it's, that you need to keep that to yourself. It's important to let yourself talk about it and work through it. This slide just goes over different calls that um, for our St. Genemans members would an, um, activate a CSM call. Again, for different people, it's, it's completely based on um, if the person wants a call. If someone says they absolutely don't want to call, of course, they, they don't need to talk to us. It's completely, it's um, voluntary. And um, these are just some big ones. Um, again, of course, for someone who's never done a cardiac arrest, that would be a reason to call for, but for another person who may, maybe has done a lot of them and they don't want to call, it's up, completely up to them. And these are just a few slides about what we do. So typically, once there's been a critical incident, then in those first um, up to before six to eight hours, you want to have a diffuse. So that can, a lot of times that happens at the event where the event officer will talk to everyone um, and just debrief about what happened. If that doesn't happen, we can, we can call everyone and um, 
just make sure they're okay. And, and um, it's not meant to be a critique of what happened at the operations. It's just to talk through um, how everyone's doing and um, any signs and symptoms they might um, expect to have and how to take care of themselves, that sort of thing. It's not a critique of, oh, you know, this person didn't do that right, many, nothing like that at all. And then after that, what we, um, this is typically where our team comes in once we've been informed of a critical incident that happened at event, we'll call them within uh, a day to three days to follow up, see how they're doing. Again, it's completely voluntary and confidential, so if someone doesn't really doesn't want to talk to us, that's completely fine, but we're always there, happy to talk whenever someone needs us. Um, but yeah, it's just meant to be a safe environment to discuss what happened, their reactions to it, how they're doing, and um, yeah, and any signs and symptoms to watch out for and how to work through those if they, um, if they are noticing that they're struggling a bit. And that's, yeah, typically we call again within a week to follow up and see how they're doing and we'll facilitate again to um, further counseling if it's needed. And this last slide here is our contact information. So at the top there is our email address. That's typically where we get most of our uh, requests. But you can also always call our uh, number there, the 24-7 hotline that is available for call anytime. We, all of us are volunteers, so we might not be able to respond right away, um, but we'll make sure that we get a response to you as soon as we can. So if there's no, if no one picks up, just please leave a voicemail and we will call you back ASAP. Um, and if you, if anyone asks, um, like say an event, an event officer asks for a debrief for anyone, if you can please list, as it says there, put their name, the member's name, their contact info, and a brief description just so we know um, how to get back to them and everything. And at the bottom there is just a little, um, so Steve Wu, our uh, deputy commissioner had created a online program where we can access just a more easy place to access all our files and, and uh, St. James files. So and if you see that link there, you can click on that and that'll get you to um, some CISM supports and our number as well. And that's about it for me. I'll stay on this page for, for now so everyone can see the numbers. Does anyone have any questions for me at all? There's a few questions that came up uh, while you were talking. Okay. Um, th there's a question, is the CISM team trained for this process and can anyone, I'm assuming anyone within St. John join the team? Right. Actually, let me see the name here. Yes, so we are trained. So we have, um, we're certainly not nothing like what Marsha is, that's for sure. But we do a uh, program through, it's called the um, International Critical Incident Stress Foundation. So we take a course that Nam if he actually created the first state, the CSM team, and um, he is trained to provide this course and he actually puts us through this course. And um, he actually has also taught it a few times throughout the province to um, other people as well. But if that's our base course, and that just teaches us how to provide initial debriefs. And it's actually the organization itself, they're, um, they're the same organization used to train government agencies and like, EMS services in the US and worldwide as well. So they're, they're very good at what they do. Um, it's, been, it's a fantastic course. Um, we also eventually took a, so that was our initial one, and then we eventually also took a group diffusion course that uh, was another weekend. So we're able to provide services for both either individual or group diffuses as well, if there's been a large incident. Um, and we currently, um, we have seven members. We are looking for another one as well, especially we only have two females on the team currently. Um, but if anyone is interested, they're always welcome to email me. You can use the CISM email uh, that works as well. Um, we're not necessarily currently needing anybody right now because uh, we, we're not getting a ton of requests, which makes sense. We're, we're not see, going to events, of course, right now. So it makes sense we're not really needing the team, which is good. That part's good. Um, but yeah, if, if you're interested, you can always let me know. Ah, hello, Nahum. Nahum's great. <laughs> Very good at what he does. <laughs> oh, hello, everybody. Um, so there's another question about how discussions are done, whether it's over the phone or video chat or in person. I'm assuming there's great geographical distances between divisions, so. Yeah. Um, sorry, did, did I miss a bit of that? Yeah, there's some, we've, hmm, 
I've, we've had requests from the interior from Kamloops. We've had, um, I haven't had any from Prince George yet, but yes, we have people in yeah, multiple different places, but it's, we can talk to anyone anywhere because it's uh, by a phone generally. If we have someone in the area and, and um, a person would like a face to per, um, a face to face meeting, we can, I've, we've done that as well. But yeah, we can we can talk to anyone anywhere. But the furthest I would say we've gone so far is the interior in Kamloops and then uh, the island. Does if I may, if I may you? wade in here, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So one other thing that we we've been doing too is it's not just providing training to the CIS team. We like to provide uh, the ICISF certification program to all of the uh, volunteers as well. So we've been teaching courses uh, from different divisions uh, and also in the interior. If you guys are interested on the island, I will be more than happy to just hop on my motorcycle, come out and uh, spend a couple of days with you guys. It's, uh, it's provided free uh, to brigade members and officers and it's a certification program. So you will get a certificate that is recognized worldwide by uh, International CIS Federation. And, uh, and I'll be more than happy to come. The, 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 the good part about the ICISF program too is they, giving, they have been giving us a lot of flexibility to teach, uh, to add on things that we thought was good. So uh, uh, if, if we teach us paramedics, for example, we'll use crazier stories and uh, if we have different ways of doing things, they're quite open to allowing us to uh, try different methodology as well. Yeah, we had actually planned to um, uh, provide that course on the island earlier this year, but then of course with COVID thing, you, you, you can't have that many people meeting at once. So then I, I think it would make sense if uh, people are interested, we could maybe try one in September if we can start doing um, courses again. All right, and there's one more question from Shanna. And um, at the end of this presentation, we'll share contact information or I can email out because people are asking for your email address, Nam. Um, maybe at the end we can discuss how we disperse uh, contact info. But Shanna's asking, how many requests does the St. John CIS team receive in a year? So it's changed quite a bit over the last few years. I think last year we had about 60, uh, I'm trying to remember now. No, sorry, that was the year before that. Last year we had about 30, but a big factor of that was a lot of our calls were coming from the opioid response um, teams that were helping out at the Surrey Strip. So we were getting quite a few calls from that. Um, but since we're no longer doing that, there aren't a ton of initiatives that are producing quite so many um, requests. So that's why last year I think it was more around 30, 40. So, but it really depends what's happening. And again, of course, this year, I, I'm assuming I can expect not very many because we're not really do, um, going to any events. But yeah, we're always here whenever, whenever we need it. Cool, those are the questions for now. Um, yeah, I'll turn myself off and hand it back over to you. Okay, thank you. Oh yes, thank you, Leon. Yeah, 20 to 30. Leon Chu was leading the team with me the last couple of years, so he's been a huge help in the team as well. Okay, so then Marsha, I will just move it over to your PowerPoint. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you. Wow. Uh, 62 people, did you say, Anna? That's a lot of people. <clears throat> Appreciate uh, you taking your time to come out and uh, and listen to this. It's great. Um, I didn't know what we know, so those are my rules. We can go to the next slide, and then uh, yeah. So I was just asked. Uh, my name is Marsha McCall. I'm the program manager for the Critical Incident Stress Program for BCEHS. <clears throat> I've been there about five years now. A little bit about my background, so you know who I am. I am. Um, I was 20 years an emergent nurse. I, my highest license level is as a clinical nurse specialist in trauma. I also am cross-trained in emergency management at the JI. Uh, so <clears throat> in some ways, I should never be teaching a course in mental health uh, because I don't really have that as my clinical specialty. However, um, I found having um, 
exposure to a lot of trauma, a useful reason why I want, would like to talk about trauma and, and critical incident stress. And I uh, thought I could share some of a uh, little bit about our program so that you have some idea of the context. Uh, also uh, to um, start um, uh, by giving a little bit of an update about pandemics. Uh, the nice thing about <clears throat> having the weird background that I have is I did work at Children's Hospital during H1N1, so I was very um, front and center as an emergency manager in that um, episode, which clinically has been very much the sort of the same journey as what we've been on with COVID, but of course, societally, an entirely different uh, situation because um, in uh, H1N1, it was children and pregnant women who took the brunt of that uh, disease process, and it was over in eight months, whereas COVID we know is a whole different uh, kettle of fish. Um, so I'd like to just go to the next slide, if you don't mind, um, Ria. And I just wanna start by thanking all of you who do what you do. I saw a few names <clears throat> in the chat room, which I recognized as paramedics from BCHS. Uh, and I always really appreciate, and certainly Nahum and I have lots of chats from coming up and down the hall to where we both work um, about um, people that do extra uh, and give back to their community in so many ways. And certainly I think anyone at St. John's is definitely doing that. Um, I don't know if there's anyone from the dog team in here, but a special shout out to you guys. Um, <clears throat> the St. John's has been providing uh, the, the ambient therapy dogs to the dispatch centers. Uh, we have three dispatch centers and uh, it's worked really well in two and a little bit rougher in the third one, but I, I know the Vancouver uh, dispatch folks um, are so sad that COVID has required them to isolate and not allow the dogs in there. Uh, but I assure you, I am keeping the treats ready for that those dogs when they, they, just, they can come back, okay? And we can go to the next slide. So I just wanted, I don't know if all of you are aware that um, this year has a mascot, but um, I do think that this was kind of a, uh, a good thing to kind of remind us where we're at and, uh, and keep going with that. So over to the next. <clears throat> Rita, you can go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So let's just talk about the CIS program. Um, paramedicine is a program that's uh, a profession that's 40 years old. And 23 years ago, um, the union started a small uh, CIS program that existed and kind of was not actually a very much different um, when I arrived five years ago and then the one that you're running had about five or six people and uh, you know was trying to respond to a number of issues. Um, Paramedics are kind of an interesting thing because they are actually as, as uh, Rhea showed one of the higher hit um, psychologically injured um, healthcare professions. So um, and first responders. So it's it's really been uh, an important journey that we've been on the last five years to um, make some really positive changes. And uh, so our program, like yours, is 24-7. Today, we have about 130 volunteer employees. And paramedics, uh, for those of you that know, are a very different uh, animal. There's very different license levels. And uh, that turned out to be very important. And so what we really focused on when we started developing our program was that a peer is your safe place. And you have to uh, know that that person is your safe place and they have to get and understand you. And so that's, we do a lot of <clears throat> matching to make sure that the, the person that um, is phoning, just like you do, uh, will get what you've been through and kind of be that person that you can talk to. Again, like yours, ours is totally voluntary. If you don't want to talk to anybody, you don't have to. And we're using exactly the same um, process, the Mitchell model. Um, and again, trying to deal with the same problem that you are. We have 4,500 employees uh, across almost 100,000 uh, kilometers, square kilometers. So it's um, as someone who came out of a hospital, this was a much more challenging uh, um, project to get involved with. We call our first call outs check-ins and they are done with um, on the phone. And, but again, we follow a, a standard pattern of uh, diffusing. Our motto is do no harm and we listen and we link just the same way you are. Over to the next one then, please. 
One of the things that we realized is to just have peer support with nothing else when you've got a group of people who have uh, experienced uh, some pretty significant events is you couldn't just do um, a peer support because that's not fair to the, your, your, um, your people that you're, work, you're responding to. And it's not fair to the peer because um, injury is, is a pretty complex thing. Uh, so we did start with our, um, our um, response section, which is where our peer team is. And then we pretty much realized that we had to have what our recovery section is. And that is counselors who have the right skills uh, that really match with our employees and can handle what they have to say. Um, it, that was a really important uh, lesson and something that we really did focus a lot. And I, my comment to you is, counselors are very much about fit. You can have a, uh, have a really good person with somebody and the next person, it's just not a fit and it's a horrible experience. So my, my advice to anybody who's going to go to counseling is check out people. If you feel like you've got a good fit, there's a safe place for them. Use them. If you don't, you know, you know, there's another one around the corner, go find them, right? It's very important to have good fit and good relationships because that's 90% of the, the journey uh, towards recovery. We kind of backed up and the opioid crisis was an important um, milestone for us. In 2016, we started to see the problems and I was activated in the emergency operations center. And because I'm an old nurse and we worked through the first opioid crisis, we knew that resilience was gonna be a problem, compassion fatigue was gonna be a problem. So that allowed us to actually start um, some education and we were able to get some funding to do some really neat stuff. And I think that has probably been another huge change in what was going on um, in acceptance of uh, it's important to look after ourselves. And uh, so this is, this is our full program. There's a lot more details in it, but we also made a very clear uh, commitment that we were gonna base our program on research and we were gonna use the CSA standards that relate to uh, safety in the workplace. So we really made a commitment to do it in, in an evidence-based way. So you can go to the next one now. And you can hear, see here, this is what has happened over the period of time. Uh, we started in 2015. Um, and so uh, this is the numbers for 2016 on, and you can see the growth of this program. Uh, it's been kind of growing by about 33% every year, but you can see in 2020, um, we're already gonna be past that. COVID really hit and really did change um, some of our responses, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. You can go on to the next one. So <clears throat> Bonnie Henry, uh, who I had the privilege of working with in uh, the H1N1, uh, has been an, a phenomenal leader. But I thought it was very interesting that her content, the things that she talked about, was that um, two out of three instructions, the be kind, be calm, and be safe, two out of three are really about mental health. And that's a really important thing, because pandemic actually has a much greater impact on mental health than it often does on physical health. And I think we all kind of know some of that now, but if you can go to the next slide, please. So this is some of the work of um, that um, um, major uh, group out of the States did, and they were using this to track disasters. So it's not quite specific to pandemic, but I was uh, listening to Everly, who is again, one of the gurus of SISM, and he referred to it, he's worked through three different uh, pandemics and said it does follow this uh, phase. And so if you look at this, you can kind of see that, um, you know, in January and February, we, we were, uh, January for sure, we were in pre-disaster. We started to become aware of it in February when we started to see some cases in, in certainly in the lower mainland here. And then of course, um, you know, the de declare, declaration of um, pandemic was March 11th, and that was certainly an impact. And then you saw amazing her heroism and a lot of first responders and the community became very heroic and you started to bend and flatten the curve. And um, so then we kind of got into the honeymoon phase and kind of in our service by midway through May, we started to see a little bit of disillusionment. The, the curve was flattening and we were starting to see a fatigue. PPE is not a fun thing to wear, never was, never will be. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was all those things. 
And so we, we know that we're somewhere in this period that uh, experts have called disillusionment. Part of it is just understanding that the world is changing and you know some people may be grieving. Uh, things are gonna be different. The little trigger events that we talk about, those are things that could be the next wave because as Dr. Bonnie Henry said, you know, there's <clears throat> gonna be more, we're not done this. But I think the nice thing too is also to realize that <clears throat> there is a way out of this. It's happened in every other disaster and it'll happen in this one too. But that's kind of the, the, the flow of this. And it's been kind of helpful for our team and our, our, our planners to sit down and think, okay, what do we have to do? Obviously, we have to be a bit more nurturing in this period of time, make sure we look for people that are maybe a bit struggling and make sure we connect them to the resources that we're gonna help them. So it's an important thing to kind of think about. And you could go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, ooh, I'm sorry, I apologize for the spelling. That was an early morning mistake. Um, the um, Everly, again, one of the gurus of CIS said that disasters do have uh, psychological toxicity. And you, that is a, a combination of a couple of things. It's the combination of the lethality and the morbidity of the event, the chronicity of the event, and the ambiguity of the event. Now, COVID has given us, it's medium contagious, uh, it's low to moderate lethality, and it does have some residual morbidity. All of this we have learned over the last period of time that we've been living through this uh, pandemic. We know that the pandemics last a while, so there's some chronicity. Ambiguity is the thing that if there's anything that we can intervene on, it might be around that. And this was an important part for us because we were trying to figure out what we, could we do for our crews to try and provide some, um, some things that would help. And that wasn't the easiest thing. Uh, the uh, novel virus, uh, certainly there was a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, ambiguity, I guess, is the best word around how risky it was. Um, was it was there asymptomatic transmission or wasn't there? That was a huge, big uh, challenge for the that was driving PPE. It's well known in disasters that you have supply chain issues, and then there was no masks at home, masks uh, at work. What type of mask? Uh, different people were using different types of masks in different healthcare settings. All of those kind of things were all impacting our crews. And I think at one point uh, they went through um, almost uh, 70 different uh, practice changes to make sure that they were safe and the people around them were safe. So it was a huge um, impact on that group of people uh, trying to do it right and get it right. And of course, you know, we're all connected uh, globally. So everyone was kind of doing things a little bit differently. And, um, and then the other thing was that disasters do change the way we work. And as many of you know that have been on the front line and, and some of you I'm sure have been to other disasters, there are some different approaches that you use in a disaster when, uh, that you don't use in normal uh, day. And, uh, and that created a bit of moral distress because the ethics uh, weren't as clear because we haven't lived through a pandemic and we don't know what a disaster looks like. We know what a car crash looks like. And so there were some challenges there. You can go on to the next slide. Okay, so just like you, we use the same, uh, the nine EMS Sentinel events, we call them. Uh, and we looked at the things that, uh, again, the ones that are in red are ones that, you know, we, we really looked very seriously at. Um, was this a disaster? Was this a multi-casualty event? That was a really hard thing because you're walking down the street, nothing has changed, everything looks normal, but actually there were a lot of casualties around and the whole healthcare system was changing because of that. Um, we have a group of paramedics who work in the community. Their whole life has been interacting with elders and going to their homes and doing some amazing things with them because of the need to conserve PPE they had to be, meet these elders on the phone. And that was a really tough struggle because they know how the elders were and, and the concern they had for their community. So it was really uh, a really a big challenge. And then the other thing is being a first responder uh, and going to work with uh, people that have this unknown virus. Um, a lot of people's families had to stand up and deal with 
Um, dad's living in the garage now, and that was a really hard thing. So these, we had lots of reasons that this was going to be, if not a critical incident stress, a cumulative stress. So um, that's kind of, um, COVID made us look at a lot of different things and think about what we were doing and how we were doing it. Next slide, please. Um, one of the most significant things, and I think probably anybody that's in the group will probably be able to uh, recognize this. One of the things that we normally do as first responders and paramedics and dispatchers, they kind of look at the world um, as if everyone else is in a bubble and they're outside the bubble. And when somebody else has a bad day and it's, it's their day to have a, an awful event, then they rush in. But it's kind of a mental protection that this isn't my emergency. I'm coming to consequence manage somebody else's emergency. But COVID certainly in the early days really made that really hard to understand. Uh, is this also my emergency? Did that little barrier that I'm used to having in the way I approach my, my patients, is that still there? Or am I also part of having my own emergency? So this was a real dilemma for a lot of um, our folks. And it's kind of been interesting over time how that changed because a lot of them now uh, have even said to me, it's almost like the bubble is getting thicker. I know that this is a dangerous world, but the inside doesn't know that. And that's kind of pushing us away. So we're kind of seeing both things. And again, this is uh, kind of a unique perspective that, uh, that we're seeing in COVID that we didn't see in other uh, pandemics. So, okay, next one, please. Okay, so um, in, a, in a disaster, we actually sort of decided to treat this as a disaster because really we had to change the way we were gonna look at the world. And so uh, in a disaster, you look at, um, you do things that are very important for survival and for recognition, because we know that people's resilience is also supported by their connection to other people. Uh, and so um, what that was definitely one of the things that, that the CIS program was really communicating to uh, information uh, teams uh, in our organization. You need to get this information out. We need to find the places to help the families understand what's going on. It took a while because there was a lot of structures that we did not have in place for something like this. So that was uh, a, a kind of a slow challenge, but we started to get more information out. And then sometimes we almost had too much information, but I think the whole world almost had a little bit of that. So, but that's important. That's the goal of early disaster support. Then we had risk reduction. And that was, we definitely need to understand what was the risk, what was working, what wasn't working. And again, that was that ambivalent part. The other thing that we know about disasters uh, and, and pandemics is that the mental health, illness, and injury is a ratio of four to one. So for every um, injury that we have in a pandemic, four more of the public are affected and therefore also probably more of us. So it was, it was a very important um, uh, issue uh, and one that we knew we had to get our hands on. Okay, off to the next one then, please. So um, that's definitely what we did. And um, we got a lot of feedback that the peer support wa was uh, hugely helpful. Um, the, pan the PPE was certainly an operational issue. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of uh, experience with that. But when everyone else is using the supply same supply chain, that was a challenge. But it was also incredibly amazing to me as someone who'd lived through the H1N1 to see how the community rallied because in, in H1N1 that didn't happen. And so people didn't start making masks and, um, and shields for people. So this was, much as it was a challenge, it was also an amazing heroic um, endeavor that the community pulled with everybody together. Family safety, again, here was another important challenge for us because normally it's not our emergency. We don't have to worry about our families, 
but that had an incredible psychological impact. And it, and one of the, it showed up one of our weaknesses is there were people willing to donate things, but we didn't have any infrastructure to really take advantage of that in early days. I mean, that again, something that got better, but it's something to be aware of um, for our services. We need to be able to, to accept help when somebody gives it. We weren't very good at accepting help. Um, we're just used to giving it. So that was, that was a, an important uh, lesson to learn for us. Next one. And I mentioned the ethics. Well, um, anyone who's gone through disaster training knows that one of the cardinal rules in BC is that uh, there's a set of objectives called the BSIRMS, BSIMS objective, depends on when you learned it. Um, and that is that first responder safety comes first in a disaster. And that's really very clear to any paramedic that's ever gone to a uh, scene or anyone who's responded to a building collapse or anything like that, firefighters, everybody knows that rule. Um, and that means you put on your PPE first and then you go into that scene. Well, the thing about the pandemic was it was a beautiful spring day and I don't know that I'm walking into um, a risk. The risk is invisible. And so that was really hard and that caused a lot of ethical dilemmas for people. Uh, is this an MCI? And it doesn't really look like it. Um, do I put the safety of the group ahead of a, a particular individual? You know, normally I wouldn't do that when I walk into somebody's home. So there were a lot of things that I think we didn't realize uh, right off the bat that a pandemic was going to challenge and, and uh, make our people really think about what they were doing and how they were going to do it. Um, and virtual care. Um, I'm, I'm a kind of physical hands-on kind of guy. You're telling me to sit at a computer and talk to uh, a senior. These were really challenging things. And, you know, they caused a lot of psychological stress uh, and, uh, and some, sometimes some team conflict when people evaluate that stress differently. Uh, fortunately, um, we had some really good ethicists and so we are doing some research on that. That's going to be available in the fall. And hopefully that'll give us some better strategies again to move forward um, in the future. So I do hope that, you know, if we can't change what's happened, at least we can learn from what's happened and go into a better place. And next slide, please. Next slide. Yep. Sorry, one sec, it doesn't want to go. That's okay. there we are. <laughs> is that not the one you wanted? No, there was one on quarantine. Ah, there we are. <laughs> Oops. That's all good. So anyway, so um, just the other thing, uh, actually back into, we were in February when we had our first quarantine of a paramedic. Uh, and that was a, another important thing that we had to learn something about. And uh, we actually did uh, end up spending, uh, doing quite a bit of peer support work with uh, people who went into quarantine. Um, and, uh, and we were incredibly fortunate in this uh, situation that we had a very small number of positives and we uh, had no losses of any of our staff. And that is so, I'm so grateful for that because at the beginning we had no idea what we were facing and certainly a lot of other teams um, of uh, first responders can't say they walked through the pandemic with that. And I just hope like heck it continues on uh, uh, through the next wave and we are uh, stay as fortunate we've been. Um, one of the things that we have to be aware of in, a, in something like this is if you've been exposed, then you're con called a contact and a contact has, has patient rights. And so we had to ask permission uh, in this particular situation to uh, have ask the client or the, the, the employee if we could con have the peer team contact them. Normally we would just reach out, but we weren't supposed to know that they had had a, this exposure. So therefore we had to ask permission for them to call us. And it was probably about 80% of the people initially uh, welcomed the CIS peer team to call and just check in. And then um, as time went on and people got more used to this, then we saw less and less. So I think in the month of June, we've maybe had uh, four calls. 
but it was really, it was nice in a way that we also saw peers when they got into trouble, they reached back out to the peer team and asked for some assistance and help. And that's great because I think uh, what you always want with your peer team and with your, your um, members of your or group is that they feel comfortable to reach out and ask for some help when they need it. Self-awareness is just a huge measure of success of any program, I think, that's doing critical incident stress. And, uh, you know, and I think I just can't say enough for the peers. We have a very strong peer team and a very strong coordination team. And they really rose to the challenge. And um, really, um, that's, that's the backbone of what we were able to, to do. And they were awesome. Um, if you could go to the next, please. Mental injury uh, for the employees. Um, referrals. Uh, interestingly enough, yeah, I mentioned that it's four to one, but um, mental injury um, to counselors has remained fairly consistent. We did see that people who were struggling before COVID actually went to have counseling more often. Yay, they knew that they needed some support and they reached out and got it. Um, and I think that's really uh, important. Um, we, we were definitely worried because uh, in a pandemic, in quarantine, it's well documented that domestic violence, suicidality are measures that go up in the community. And we were very concerned about that and that, that, that we would have some really uh, tough challenges. So, um, and again, these things, we're still in it uh, and we have to be aware. So when people talk to us, you know, it's important to be open and it's important to listen and link if you can, because that's, we're still in that, um, this phase where things are changing for people. Um, sometimes it's financial stuff that's uh, really affecting them. Sometimes it's work-related stuff. Sometimes it's being a parent 24 seven, which they haven't had to be before. All of those things can affect people in this, this time. And again, it's just knowing when to help people reach out and get the right help. Um, one of the things that we are concerned about with paramedics is, um, is um, suicidality. And there's some newer research that sort of says the more suicides that you are exposed to, the more that can impact you. And certainly um, we did start to see what we thought was maybe a, a change um, based on our numbers, it proved not to, but the, the feeling was that something was different in the community. And again, so that's something that we are continuing to watch and monitor going forward. Next one. Okay, um, the current state. Well, we are definitely at the end of the beginning. Um, I definitely um, have been able to feel uh, some of the, the fatigue that is part of this phase uh, coming from our, our crews, um, the PPE, the heat and just, uh, exhaustion. Uh, definitely, there's still uh, a little bit of what we call cognitive distances. Things aren't matching right up. Um, people in the small communities are saying, well, is there still risk? There hasn't been anybody in my community ever. Uh, and we definitely saw a difference between northern BC and, and, the, and the island and, and the southern part of the island. So there was definitely, um, you know, people were having different experiences. And, um, um, and, and I think we will continue to have that as people evaluate risk and figure out what is the right thing to do. Uh, some people definitely were grieving their loss of freedom. Uh, that was definitely a, a real change. And there were some really, there have been some really positive things that have come out of this. I think a lot of people I have heard from more recently are talking about how um, parenting roles have changed and, uh, and that seeing some really positive things there. So, um, and, then, and then some negative ones. So I'm, I think I see there's a fair number of questions coming in, but I think what I'll do is I'll just run to the end and then we'll come back and, and do these questions. And so I, just please write them down if you, so that we don't lose uh, any of your thoughts. Um, okay, and the next slide. I want to, oh, did I, uh, oh, did I, did I lose a slide there? Uh, the end of the beginning. Okay, nope, that's right, yeah. So, um, I just want to uh, point out, um, 
we had uh, Dr. Mark Davies is a psychologist that has worked with um, BC Ambulance since the opioid crisis, and he was the person responsible for doing the um, the compassion fatigue course that uh, so many of the paramedics really felt was was incredibly valuable. So we reached out to him at the uh, in March and asked him to put together a video series on building resilience in the time of COVID. And so he kind of, we had lots of discussion. He talked to some of the paramedics out there so that he would be able to build something that was useful. And he's built a, a course called um, Based on Surviving a Prolonged Threat. And uh, I thought it's, it's really uh, uh, available to uh, some of, <laughs> fairly early on some of the people said can you make it available to our families because we would like them to be able to see that and so what we did do is put that onto our bcehs website so there are six sessions that are available there on that and it, you're it's just a, it's a youtube channel so anyone is able to download it uh and he is uh definitely focusing on building resilience in the time of COVID. You access it through the website, through the health and through info, through COVID-19. Uh, and I thought what was really neat is uh, one of his sections is called focusing on the positive. And one of the CIS peers of her own initiative reached out and said to her, her, her colleagues, okay, let's do a 30 day challenge every day. Let's put on something on this bulletin board that we can uh, be uh, grateful for or um, that that we have gotten through uh, with COVID. And for those of you that are um, good readers of this, the Twinkie wrapper was one that I thought was really uh, quite ingenious, but you know, sometimes you gotta take the small wins where you can. So uh, definitely uh, it's open to anybody to to use and I'm I definitely encourage any of you to have a look at him. He's an awesome um, uh, person. Uh, he learned a lot on how to, um, do video work because he'd never done it before either and you can see where he's got his stash of toilet paper but um, hang in there they're about 30 minutes each and definitely worth uh, checking out okay and the next one, please so um, we're getting ready for wave two and we have two future strategies that I just wanted to mention to you because they may be useful for you um, uh, we have been working since um, 2018 on, on a uh, tool uh, that is paramedic specific. So we, in 2018, 700 paramedics answered a survey question for us on what was making them particularly resilient. And that was um, headed by a psychologist. And since that time, he has uh, worked together on putting together a workbook uh, that will be available to anybody free of charge but it will be coming out uh, to our folks um, this summer and then it'll be able to be downloaded through this site uh, free of charge in the future so it's not there yet but it will be coming and it is paramedic specific however i think for most first responders it will have some really good uh, tips in it he's a very experienced psychologist this is dr dan bilsker and merv gilbert and has he has written some of these things before so please um, check it out it's uh, it's a good tool to um, um, help you plan how to be resilient uh, the other thing that is coming out is some work that we have been working with um, in uh, since 2016 we have been building our own app uh, again, to be very specific to um, paramedics, but using the skills of Dr. Um, Davies and other um, of our advanced uh, psychologists to build some very specific resilience skills. We've designed this around a calendar so that, you know, if you've worked with first responders, they have the most confusing uh, schedules known to mankind. And so this is a 24-7 shift calendar that they can fill in and mark not only when they're working, but how they're gonna fill in their self-care strategies. So um, that will be coming out uh, very shortly um, in uh, July for the pilot. And then while the ShiftWell app is going to be exclusive use to BCEHS, uh, if you're interested in this, both TELUS and the Ministry of Health are in discussions now how this could be shared with other organizations. And so it, it may be worth um, looking into to kind of learn a little bit more about that.
Okay, and and the next one, please. Uh, okay, okay. Um, I just want to say two other things before we get into this, and then I want to open it up for more discussion. And that is, uh, there's a couple of other apps that we recommend to people that are free, that might be useful. So I'm just going to give you those now. As, um, there's one called Road to Mental Readiness, R2MR. It is um, an app that the military designed for mental health has some great uh, skills on it for stress in the moment, and that's really what it's before, for. We teach this to all the new uh, paramedics. Um, so it's goal setting, mental rehearsal, tactical breathing, that kind of stuff. There's also a very good brand new uh, app called Ready for Duty, which is again designed for paramedics, which is the physical fitness side of, of that kind of industry. So it would be well worth looking at. It's also free. And then the uh, US um, military has done uh, two very good uh, apps called PTSD Coach and PTSD Family for anybody that you know that may have that, uh, that problem, uh, that mental health illness. Um, learning to live with it is a tough thing so this is uh this is an app that are, is good for those two um uh, parts of, of um ptsd just the the um coach how to handle your own symptoms and then for the family how to handle to handle the situation when your loved one has ptsd so with that um i love the expression i think it's a very accurate one we may be all in the same storm, but we are not in the same boat. So with that, I'd like to turn it back to Anna. And Anna, you can lead us through the questions and whatever else people would like to, to talk about. Absolutely. Um, there were a few that came up. Um, there was one that came up fairly early on in the presentation uh, when there was a bunch of symptoms listed for um, strain and stress and so on. And there was one that says, um, if you're having trouble sleeping, that could be a sign. So somebody asked, what do you do if you can't sleep? Well, I mean, one of the things that we teach, we do teach tactical breathing uh, because that is you learning to use your own um, nervous system to manage uh, itself. So if it's not a really tough thing, um, a lot of, uh, we definitely work on sleep hygiene. So there's definitely a lot of things you can do in your environment to support your sleep. Uh, we talk about, um, and, and again, there's a number of very good sleep apps. Learning about your sleep is very important. The Fitbit has a very good um, a sleep stages thing, which will show you what you're doing and what your sleep is all about. So that's, I mean, the experts use the, the Fitbit, so you can too. Um, so that's uh, another area. Um, I think uh, being aware of your blue, your blue light um, because your computer, if it's, or your iPhone, if it's not on a, a night light is actually waking you up. So uh, that's another thing to be aware of. And then food, the impact of caffeine and all those things is very important to kind of look at. As well, um, alcohol. Um, alcohol, in, in my generation of nurses, we used to think that it was quite normal to go and, and have a drink or three before you went to bed and think that that was kind of a normal way to get to sleep. In reality, what that does is you will get to sleep, but you will wake up and you won't go through your sleep cycles normally. So, um, you know, it's also thinking about what are the other things that are going into my body that'll help. Stress, the best thing to work on stress is probably the tactical breathing, which is quad breathing. Breathe in for four, hold for four, out for four, hold for four, and just keep doing that. If, if you can do it naturally, that, that's probably one of the best things you can do for yourself. Awesome. Um, I might unmute Ria or Nam or anybody else from the, the um, SJACIS team. There were a few questions about our program here. Um, somebody wanted to know if St. John has a list of counselors that are vetted for the cases that we see. I can probably address that. 
uh, we currently don't have any. Uh, one of the points in, in our development of this particular team, uh, that was about five years ago now, uh, to eventually have trained counselors on, um, on our contract. And uh, unfortunately, due to the uh, huge loss of budgets uh, that we experienced a, a few years ago, uh, in, in particular, uh, losing the um, OFA3 uh, training courses and stuff. We lost a lot of money and that was put onto the side. And uh, <clears throat> so at that time, what I decided to do was I'm going to get myself trained as a counselor. And uh, it, uh, well, unfortunately, it's going to take five years uh, to provide some of these at an extremely decounted rate. So, uh, however, in the meanwhile, we do have an agreement with Jill, who is no longer with us, unfortunately, uh, that if we have a very severe case, we'll set aside some budget to, um, to put some of our members through counseling. But luckily in the last uh, seven or eight years since I started this program, uh, we have not had one case that we need to put to a counselor yet. Um, somebody else was asking, who makes up the peer teams? Are they MFRs? Do they have field experience? Um, I understand there's seven people around the province. Are they just regular volunteers? What do, what, what do they do? How did they get started? Rhea, Rhea can probably answer that. Yeah, sure. Um, so yes, all of us are volunteers. Um, that's one of the base requirements is that you were a volunteer with St. Chinemets, of course. We have various different experiences just based on our backgrounds. We do, um, when we have applicants, we do send out, send out questions and um, either do face-to-face -face or in-person or uh, over the phone interviews to just evaluate their ability to handle conflict, stress. Um, so it's it's par partially based on just their availability, but also ability to handle um, their maturity levels, that sort of thing, of course. So we, in regards to training, we pr we provide the course that I would, the two-day course that name was uh, referring to. Uh, it's called assistance or um, assisting individuals in crisis. So we provide that uh, and we always make sure that anyone that is added to the team does take that course before they're asked to be providing degrees. Um, but other than that, we don't necessarily require any actual training other than being willing to help out, uh, of course, uh, have the time to do it uh, and the maturity level and um, and the ability to listen as well. We try to value that as much as possible because that's, that's one of the biggest things you need to be able to do, of course, is, is with that listening ear. Absolutely. There's a, um, Franco has his hand raised. I don't know if you want to unmute yourself, Franco, and ask your question or if that was an accident or, <laughs> but you can go ahead. Uh, hi there. I just want to say thank you. Excellent job and uh, well, well worth the effort of sitting in tonight. Thanks, Marcia and Ria. Thank you. Thank you. Glad you could join us. Okay, um, I think that's pretty well all the questions that came up uh, in the chat room that I saw. Um, so I'll turn it back to you guys. Okay, well, I have one last slide, so maybe we'll do that. Okay, let me just get out of this. Now, I'm not sure what these paramedics are actually doing, but I've learned to just accept paramedics for who they are. And if they're upside down, it's all good. But I just want to remind you that self self care is not selfish. It definitely is survival. And when you're giving uh, to others, it's really important that you give to yourself. Uh, or you have nothing left to give. So I put all of you in that category. You're giving to others. Um, make sure you look after yourselves and do what you need to do to have a happy, fulfilled life. Um, it's you're a great team, great service, and um, you're. It's really uh, 
uh, an honor for me to be asked to come and speak to you. Thanks. I second that. <laughs> Thank you so much to both of you for joining us. That was really great. Um, at least in my experience with St. John, this topic isn't one that's touched on very often. Um, so it's great that we can have these talks and maybe start having discussions and maybe paying attention a little bit more to the calls that we do and how members react. Um, there's a lot of thank yous popping up uh, <laughs> in the chat box there. Uh, for everyone watching, there were lots of questions about the links and the apps that were talked about. Um, we'll try and get them sent out to everyone so you have them in one nice, easy spot. Um, you want me to just uh, email the ones I had to you, Anna? Yeah, that would, that would probably work and then I can send them out to everyone on the list. I'll stay on a little bit longer in case there's more questions. I'm just going to double check there weren't any more private ones. Um, and Nick, if you're listening, do you want to put up that slide with contact info? <laughs> we'll just take over a screen share for a moment. Uh, so Nick, over in the next room for me, is going to put up my contact information. So if anybody uh, has any questions about this presentation or wants more information, I have everybody's email addresses so I can hopefully send you to the right person. Um, yeah, and everyone should have the CISM email address now from that slide, but we'll get that sent out as well. And I'll certainly send you, Anna, the, all the uh, apps that I mentioned. Perfect. That would be great. I tried scribbling them down, but <laughs> if I can read my writing later, that would be great. <laughs> I think I um, will add those to the CIS and resources I have as well, if you're okay with that, Marsha, just as other tools and resources people can use. The other one I actually forgot is uh, the Canadian uh, Institute of Public Safety Research and Treatment. They have um, uh, adjusted uh, self assessment so if there's a self assessment tool for firefighters and paramedics mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So, and it has a lot of clinical knowledge in that as well. So we always send our counselors to that uh, source as well, um, as well as the First Responder Mental Health Committee, which we're a part of. What was that called again? The Canadian Institute of Public Safety. Okay, I'm going to scribble that down quick. Okay. Uh, thanks from Ontario, and uh, that was a real nice talk. Hope to see uh, you on uh, chat later. Bye. Thanks, thanks Gord. <laughs> Hello yeah. from BC. Glad you could join. <laughs> you get 10 points for being still up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Ontario contingent has been dedicated because this is like past 10 p.m. for them, so. <laughs> <laughs> So neat to be talking to you all the way over the over the pot. Well, <laughs> over the well, country. that's that's one thing that this you know as bad as this uh, virus is, it's done one good thing. Uh, you know, when could I attend a course uh, in BC when I'm in Ontario? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, <kidding>. cheaply. <laughs> good point. <laughs> We're learning different things. <laughs> okay. Good night. Good, good night. night. Uh, we're just trying to get Nick's screen up here. Nick, you should be able to pop yours up there. Um, there's a question and a comment here. One of the most stressful parts is when people won't go to the hospital with paramedics. I respond to overdoses and people with chronic addictions. That's definitely a challenging situation. Um, St. John in Victoria has clinics at some of the drop-in centers and shelters and just getting or just building that trust with someone after their trust in the um, health system has been broken um, 
it's definitely a challenging situation. I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that further while I try and share Nick's screen here. <laughs> um, the one thing um, there is, um, I, sh I should look into it. There's a very good lecture that we did. We got uh, Dr. Um, Christy Sutherland to do back in 2017 and we made it available to the public. So I will check in and see. It's a, probably one of the best um, videos I've ever seen on explaining addiction. And sometimes that, that is kind of helpful to reframe what you're thinking about because addiction it doesn't follow a straight line and neither does, you know, trying to talk them into the ambulance. It, it really is um, a real process. Um, that we have to let them own to some extent. So uh, that I'll, I'll send that along too. I'll check that the link is still uh, available to the public um, because I would certainly think it's well worth people seeing. And she probably, she would do way better at job time. She's now, I think they just named the head of Dixon. Yeah, and I, I think, um, like I just recently learned about the trauma-informed care um, view, and it's a lot of times, unfortunately, like it's not like we ever meant or mean for that to happen, but going to hospital can be re-traumatizing for them, and, and they know, you know, the negative viewpoints people might have and uh, things they might see when, they, when they're brought in. So yeah, the best thing we can ever do is just try to always make sure that we are supportive and that we're not... And, and being aware of our, our own biases as well and making sure that we're not, you know, bringing that across in any way so that they can, they feel um, supported from us as well. And that they will um, be given help if they come in. Trauma-informed care is a huge thing, both for addictions, but it also learning. So in all the topics that we're having right now, mm -hmm. for everybody. All of us are aware of the care and communication. Okay, so we, Nick has just thrown up our social media stuff. If you want to follow St. John Ambulance Victoria Division, we've got a Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter. Um, Nick, do you want to put up the one with my email address if you have it handy? Boom. So it's just um, just at the bottom here, a stuff like at div176.ca. If you have any questions, I can forward them to the appropriate people. Uh, if you want to be added to our mail list, uh, send me an email there and I can add you directly for our weekly meeting uh, invitations. And I will get, uh, Marsha's just sending me the names of all the apps, so I will try and send those out to everybody watching as soon as I can. If I can, Anna, really fast. Um, yeah. Well, I've been trying to send you a message. I'm not sure if you're getting them or not. Um, what we can do, folks, is we can actually make sure that the uh, uh, links to the apps and some of the various resources that Marsha and Ray talked about are available at the uh, in the comments just below the YouTube video when it's get when it gets posted as well. And maybe if we could just ask Marsha and Rhea just if there was anything in terms of uh, those resources uh, that you mentioned or talked about uh, tonight that you didn't want to be shared broadly publicly, um, please just indicate that and we'll make sure that, that you know anything that was sort of intended just for this group stays that way. Um, but otherwise we'll have be able to include those links so anyone who watches this video in the future uh, or watches this session in the future can, uh, can have access to that easily as well. Sounds good. All right. Nick, do you maybe want to announce next week's topic while we're hanging out? If anybody has any questions for Marsha or Rhea, um, please put them in the, in the comments box. We're sticking around for a little bit longer. But in the meantime, Nick, I don't know if you want to introduce next week's session while we still have uh, I, people. Sure, yeah. I, I, uh, it, it's, uh, I believe we're, we're confirmed now. Um, for those of you who remember Dr. Nav Chima, who's uh, the Divisional Medical Officer for Division 176 here in Victoria, uh, Dr. Chima is an anesthetist with, uh, I believe, Fraser Health, and he's just on his way out to uh, 
uh, a fellowship out in Ontario. Um, but one of his last acts before he leaves, uh, before he skips town for the uh, for the next year, is uh, is going to be presenting uh, Trendelenburg, the man, the myth, the legend, uh, and talking about patient positioning. Uh, and uh, specifically, there's a lot of of EMS mythology around the benefits or not benefits of uh, of different types of patient positions and raising legs in trauma and not raising legs in trauma. And Dr. Chima has done this uh, a couple times for Division 176, but we'll spend an hour or so talking about uh, what all that stuff really means and uh, how we can uh, implement some of that knowledge in our clinical practice uh, for the benefit of our patients. I'm going to mute myself. I can hear sirens out the window now, so I'm going to put myself back on. 107 Fox rides. Ah. <laughs> uh. There's a few more thank yous in the chat. Um, Ria or Nam or, oh, one sec. Uh, someone says, I don't usually feel the need to diffuse since the addicts don't want to lose their high. They don't want to go to the hospital. Also, many people who are close to the streets feel disrespected at the hospital. Yeah, um, for sure. Um, I, I, if I can, I'd like to just maybe just, you know, very respectfully take one issue uh, with that. I, I, I spend a lot of time working with street level populations. I, uh, uh, Anna and myself and St. John here helped start up uh, Victoria's first uh, overdose prevention site. Um, you know, I've spent myself uh, a year working in uh, in one of our supervised consumption sites here as well. So I, I feel like I've spent a lot of time interacting with our street level folks. And um, addicts not wanting to lose their high is very rarely in my experience, if not maybe even never, um, a primary motivation for people not wanting to go to hospital. It's exceptionally unusual yeah. um, for that to be the, the main motivation. Normally uh, it's because people have either had very negative experiences with hospitals in the past. Um, many of them, uh, as I'm sure uh, Marsha and Rhea will attest to, uh, have been traumatic experiences and they don't want to be re-traumatized. Um, many healthcare providers, unfortunately, um, do carry a lot of stigma towards substance users. And uh, people learn very quickly that they might not always get the best treatment um, when they go to the hospital. Many of them, uh, to be quite honest, if people have, have gone through addiction for a long time, many of them have overdosed a number of times in the past and often will feel comfortable and safe um, having been resuscitated, uh, being left in the care of their peers, you know, uh, um, you know, especially in situations where there's a group of people around and, you know, people are able to be monitored by their, their friends and their colleagues or their family. Um, so all of these things go into a very complicated decision that people may or may not make to, to not want to go to hospital, but uh, not wanting to lose their high is, is uh, I wouldn't put that even on the top five or 10. Yeah, I would say by that point, they've lost their high by everybody who's Narcaned them. Um, but there's so much more that goes into it, at least in Victoria, the kind of centers where the overdose prevention sites and the supervised consumption sites are, they're not exactly close to the hospital. So for someone to go to the hospital, they're going to have to leave all their worldly belongings with them or their tent unattended or their dog or something. Um, they're worried about their stuff getting stolen. They're worried about whether they're going to be able to get back to where their next meal is or where their next shower is. It's not as easy as, you know, for the middle class housed person to just hop in an ambulance and go and somebody will pick them up. Like, you know, this person might have their cart that's left behind or there's so much more that they think about when they make the decision to go or to not go. Um, when I worked 
in the overdose prevention site, it took a lot of convincing. And I would, if I thought somebody needed to go, then I would work extra hard to convince them. But if it was just a regular overdose, then we would find them supports within the drop-in center um, with the outreach workers and other staff where they would, um, where we could still monitor them, but they didn't have to be removed from their environment where they had everything. All right. I think the comments are kind of slowing down. So um, we can probably end it there. I will make sure to get stuff sent out to everybody as soon as we kind of gather everything. Off topic, did the Reach Out Center provide a place to secure their personal items? Uh, depends on where you are. Uh, our place at 919 Pandora now has storage facilities. Uh, Nick, you can better speak to what the harbor has, but if I remember correctly, they have some sort of, did they, didn't they? I can't remember. I've only worked there a few shifts, but. Yeah, I, I have to be very cautious because uh, a lot of, uh, a, I, I'm not representing uh, either my employer or any of the contracted agencies associated with my employer at that site right now. Um, but I think broadly speaking, uh, there is, there's no official storage located at that site that's available to people. There, there might be exceptional circumstances where something would be able to be stored for a short period of time. Um, you know, certainly, broadly speaking, uh, folks who are street level who might be at a consumption site uh, or an overdose prevention site or, or you know, some other similar facility um, might be lucky enough to have outreach staff who are able to find a way to take care of stuff for a few hours while they go to hospital. But it can take someone, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours to be transported to hospital, wait to see a physician, wait to go through all that process, get out of the hospital, and then, um, you know, possibly have to walk two, three, four, five, six, seven kilometers back to wherever all their, their personal belongings were, um, you know, uh, assuming that there was a place to keep them. It might be 10, 12, 24 hours before they can come back. And for folks who, uh, who suffer from overdoses on the street, um you know your stuff's not going to be there when you get back unfortunately so yeah um, sure anyway uh, on that note i uh i don't know do we have anything else before we call it an evening i see uh andy and shirley and camlips just suggested that this might be a good a uh, good topic for another session it's funny you say that because it's actually already on the <laughs> list of things that we're trying to work on it's just not officially on the official list yet so yeah uh, we'll, we'll try and do something on uh, on substance use yeah, Nick and I could probably talk for hours about the yeah. the weird world of overdose prevention sites. Yeah, very much. <laughs> and I worked on the very first one, so <laughs> way back in the '90s. So yeah, no, it's it's a amazing. There's no other place like it. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the understatement of the night, Marcia. <laughs> But I, I do think Christy Sutherland's, you know, her her explanation of addiction is probably the one of the best I've ever seen. And I did hear a bit about that stuff. So, yeah, I'll see if I can get that for you. Thank you so much, Marcia. I'll turn myself back off here and uh, let Anna wrap up. Thank you again to you as well, Anna, for organizing this. And thank you, Marcia, for speaking. I really appreciate it. Yes, thank you both for taking time out of your evenings to talk to us. We had probably the best turnout to date. We had 70 people. Um, so that's awesome. Um, yeah. Well done. You're, you're putting us to shame. We, we're going to try this new technology. You made it look so easy, Anne. <laughs> well, we've had a few weeks to gain a following. So <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again, and thanks for inviting me. Mm -hmm. You're okay, then I'll sign out then. Yeah, thank we'll you. chat by email. Okay, sounds great. Thanks great, again. thank you. Bye, nice everyone. You, Bye. Nice meeting you, Ria. Bye bye. <laughs> yeah. uh, there was just someone that was privately messaging me. I'll just check if there's any other ones. 
No, I think we're good. Okay, I guess I will head out too. Thank you, Anna. Okay, no, thank yeah. you for organizing all of this. That was great. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to. It was, like I said, you know, it's, I can't really go to divisions right now for training. So yeah, one good, good way to do it instead. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Okay. Maybe one day, maybe one yeah, day. Yeah, <laughs> right? No, I, don't know. I don't know what to expect. So. <laughs> All right, I well, just expect that it'll be very different when we do open. Yeah, yeah, so no kidding. We're kind of trying to plan what that could look like at 176 but it's all like does everybody wear a mask and face shield who knows yeah. right <laughs> yeah, you're in such pl close proximity of course yeah, yeah. sims sim nights and stuff or yeah. <laughs> who knows Try to make a final role without getting in someone's face yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right well good luck and all the best you take care are you a paramedic yourself yeah, yeah. Okay. I work okay. in my hometown, I guess. I work in Souk. Okay. I live in Souk, so. Uh, oh, well, perfect then. Yeah. <laughs> Not anymore. Yay. I, yeah, I haven't. I lateral to Souk in January, so before that I was on Salt Spring. So this is the first time in my career, really, where I'm, you know, five minutes from the station and can kilo from home. So. <laughs> Finally, hey. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, um, I guess there's not that many people left, but yeah, I'm always happy to chat with anybody, try to spread the word as much as I can about the team. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I read on the MFR website, that new one. Um, yeah. So essentially something happens, we'll try and debrief kind of at the divisional level. We can refer people to you. And mm -hmm. then is it just a series of like, meetings, phone conversations. Um, Marsha was mentioning that we can probably get into a work safe kind of yeah. situation yeah, is, with the counselors. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That is something um, I'd like to sort out a bit more. Actually, maybe I'll make a note about it again because I have heard that before that we could potentially go that route. Um, if we ever needed counseling but yeah typically like what seems to happen from my experience so far is that like if there's a critical incident uh, generally there's always the, like the lead of the event will debrief it with everyone as a group and then typically they'll send out everyone's contact info to us and then we call them to follow up and see how they're doing and just have a chat with them mm -hmm. and then we follow up again a week later and then if there's still if they still you know we're thinking of another follow-up might be not a bad idea then we follow up again another week later um, but that's typically about it is like max two to three calls, I guess I'd say. Um, and, by, and by that point, if someone's really struggling, then yeah, that's when we would yeah, uh, consider yeah. moving further. But yeah. 